Imagine, imagine you live in a utopia. What does it look like? Maybe it's filled with futuristic cities. Maybe it's a rural world in which people live in harmony with the natural environment. I wonder if my utopia is the same as your utopia or the person sitting next to you. I wonder if there's mental illness in your utopia. About, about 10 years ago, I was driving around the M25 and my car helpfully decided to dump its coolant all over the road. I called the breakdown service and a very nice guy called Graham came out, looked at my car and confirmed that it did, in need, it did in need, indeed need to be towed. It's a couple of hours drive from London to Oxford, so we had quite a long time to chat. On the journey, as, as you do, he asked me what it is that I do for a living and I explained that I'm a scientist and I'm interested in the biological basis of mental health and mental illness. He then told me the most extraordinary story about his childhood. Extraordinary because he was raised by his mum, who was later diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He told me very vividly what it was like to see her symptoms through a child's eyes. And there was one thing that he said in particular that has really struck, struck me and stuck with me. He said that one day she'd taken to her bed, she was very depressed and she couldn't get up. He'd gone in to see if he could coax her out of bed. But he said as soon as he walked in the door, he knew that that wasn't going to happen. In his words, I looked at the bed and I saw this woman in the bed that looked like my mum, but I could see it wasn't my mum really. In subsequent years, I've had the privilege to talk to lots and lots of people about their experiences with mental health and mental illness. I doubt there's a single person here who hasn't been touched by this in some way. And what I've learned is that everybody's experience is different. Some people see their illness as entirely separate from themselves. You may have heard how Churchill used to refer to his depression as a black dog. But for other people, it's more complicated. They find their symptoms interwoven with who they are as individuals. Some people have told me they see their ill self as like a shadow self of themselves. Whilst for other people, their symptoms are a core part of who they are, their personality, and who they are as individuals. It's this complexity that drove me to work in this field. I think it's absolutely fascinating that we can start to understand these things from a biological point of view. And fundamentally, I think that understanding the biology of mental health and mental illness tells us a lot about who we are as humans. Before we can consider whether there would be mental illness in a utopia, I'd like to spend a few minutes telling you about what we know about the causes of mental illness. The first thing, probably the most important thing, is that there is no single cause of mental illness. Instead, um, the symptoms that we see in people appear to arise from lots of things that individually slightly increase somebody's risk of becoming ill. We call these risk factors. Another thing that we know is that genes are really important. We know that genes form a, a major component of all of the major mental illnesses. The extent to which genes are important varies between different diagnoses. For example, they seem to be less important in depression than they are in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. But nonetheless, genes are important in all of these conditions. In the last few years, it's a really exciting time for me to be working in the field because we've started to move from the sort of generic understanding that genes are important to understanding the specifics. In the last few years, people have started to identify the precise parts of the human genome, that is, our entire genetic makeup, that predispose us to develop mental illness. As a biologist, this is hugely exciting, but it's also a massive challenge, because what genes absolutely don't do is to encode mental illness. Genes don't encode hallucinations, psychosis, low mood, mania, or any of the other complex symptoms that we see in people. Instead, what genes do is to encode molecules. These molecules form to build cells. These cells form networks in the brain, and it's this network activity that gives rise to the complex psychological processes that are altered in patients with mental illness. So for me, the challenge is to understand these links. How do we get from a single part of the human genome up to the complex symptoms that people experience? It's a massive challenge, but I think it has huge potential, not only in understanding these illnesses better, but also in terms of developing treatments. To give you an example from my own research, I'm currently interested in a family of, of genes that encode calcium channels. What these genes do is they sit on the surface of electrically active cells, like heart cells and brain cells, and they allow calcium into the cell when the cell is electrically active. 
thing is, though, these genes are really complicated. They don't, each gene doesn't just encode one calcium channel, but instead it encodes tens or maybe even hundreds of different, slightly different calcium channels. So what my research is trying to do is to under, I understand which of these calcium channels are most important for mental illness, because I think this will give us some insight into the biology. In addition, I'm also trying to identify those that are present in the brain versus other electrically active tissues like the heart. I think this could be really important for developing new treatments, because obviously if we want to treat the symptoms of psychiatric illnesses, mental illnesses, we probably want to target the calcium channels that are present in the brain and not those that are present in the heart, because doing so is likely to cause side effects. Although genes are really important, they're far from being the entire story. We know that the environment plays a huge role in predisposition to mental illness. Stress and trauma, for example, are big risk factors for developing depression. And birth complications and the use of cannabis during adolescence have small but um, measurable effects on risk for things like schizophrenia. It's tempting always to kind of argue about whether genes or environment are more important. And this does happen a lot, both in my field and more widely. But I think to do so misses the point. Because what these things do, genes and environment, is to alter the function of the brain. And it's the brain and the psychological processes that it gives rise to that are core to mental illness. So simplistically, you could think that maybe what your genes do is to build your brain to be a certain way that makes you more or less resilient to the things that you encounter as you go about your business in the world. But I think this is an oversimplification. Your brain isn't just a blob of jelly hanging about in your head waiting to, to see what happens when you blunder around the world. The brain is highly dynamic and it's extremely plastic. It changes in response to absolutely everything we do. So waking up this morning, having a cup of coffee that you had before you came in here, learning something new, all of these things have measurable effects on your brain. So the environment changes our brain. We also know that the environment changes the way in which our genes operate. But perhaps counterintuitively, I think that our genes also influence the environment in which we find ourselves. I know this is a slightly kind of odd concept, so I'll walk you through an example. We know that um, genes influence how likely pe people are to be risk-seeking or risk-averse. We also know that people who are more risk-seeking are more likely to use illicit drugs like <coughs> cannabis. So this is an example whereby if your genes make you more risk-seeking, you, you might be more likely to use cannabis, which is one of the environmental risk factors. So taking all of this together, uh, the causes of mental illness are extremely <coughs> complex. Both genes and the environment are important. But I think that what we should really be thinking about is in terms of what these things do to the brain and the psychological processes that the brain gives rise to. Notably, all the treatments we have for mental illness at the moment target the brain, either directly by influencing um, direct brain function in the case of drugs, or indirectly in the case of psychological therapies by acting on the psychological processes that the brain gives rise to. So what does all this mean for our utopia? What even is a utopia? I strongly suspect that when I asked you to think about that, everybody was thinking about something slightly different. However, for the purposes of argument, we need to have a definition of a utopia. And because I'm standing here on this stage, we're going to go with my utopia. <laughs> and if you want to live in my utopia, you have to live by my rules. Rule one, no changing genes. I've seen enough sci-fi movies to know that this never ends well, but there's two very good reasons in the case of mental illness why we absolutely wouldn't want to do this. The first is pragmatic. The genetics of mental illness are incredibly complicated. It's not the case that it's just one or two genes that are altering our risk for mental illness. Rather, it's tens, hundreds, or perhaps even thousands. So I can't see that we would ever be able to get to a place where we can look at somebody's genetics and predict with any level of certainty whether or not they are going to become ill. The second reason is more philosophical, but I think it's actually more important, and that is this. The genes that alter our risk for mental illness are the ones that influence brain function. As such, I think it's highly likely that these are also the same genes that influence who we are as individuals, our unique personalities. In my utopia, I don't want it filled with everybody who's the same with a perfect brain who thinks in a certain way. I want to capture all of the unique human diversity in the world. So no changing genes. The environment, however, that definitely needs to change. <laughs> 
my utopia is an egalitarian society where people are treated with equally and with equal respect for one another. As a result, levels of trauma and stress plummet and with them risk for things like depression particularly. So we would definitely see a decrease in levels of mental illness within the population. Other environmental risk factors might be more difficult to change, however. If you think about birth complications, for example, obviously in my utopia, mental health, uh, medical care will be exemplary, but I think we're going to struggle to completely eliminate birth complications for the simple reason that we've evolved to be a species that has a very large brain and a very big head and ultimately a small body. And just so the logistics of birth are inherently risky for us. So some things in the environment we can change, some things uh, we may or may not be able to change. In the middle, though, I think there's quite an interesting grey area. I strongly <coughs> suspect that when you take out big risk factors for mental illness, like stress and trauma, that you'll start to see other environmental risk factors emerge that we can't detect at the moment. Ultimately, I think anything that's not great for our brain is probably going to be an environmental risk factor for uh, mental illness. So why not get rid of all of these things? Well. We could do that, but three of my favourite things are surfing, skiing and a glass of red wine. None of these things, sorry to break it to you, are likely to be terribly good for my brain. Um, but I can't imagine a utopia in which I wasn't allowed to do these things. Taking all of this together, I think that there would definitely be a decrease, a dramatic de decrease in the amount of mental illness in a utopia. But I think there will still be some level of mental illness present. I also think the types of mental illness that we see will, will change quite markedly. So I think factors that are more affected by environment, like depression, for example, and anxiety, will be more, um, more reduced in this utopia than the kind of diagnoses like bipolar disorder and depression, which are more genetic in origin. So I just want to leave you with one final thought, and that is this. I believe firmly that the risk factors for mental illness overlap substantially with the risk factors, sorry, with the factors that make us our individual unique people. And therefore, I think on some level, mental illness is the price that we pay for our unique and diverse humanity. Thank you.